All right, hello everyone and welcome to session two of our 24th iteration of the Massive Open Online uh, course for the University of Nicosia's master's degree in digital currencies. Uh, my sincere apologies, we had a slight uh, technical problem because as soon as we tried to go live, of course, that is the moment that my laptop decided it, doesn't, it didn't have USB ports, never seen them, never heard of them, I don't know what USB is, and suddenly forgot about all of my connections. So I had to reboot that. Um, so uh, the unfortunate truth is that uh, being a computer scientist does not prevent you from suffering all of the indignities of hardware and software that happen to everybody else. Um, the, and uh, nor does it give you uh, much better troubleshooting mechanisms other than uh, have you tried turning it on and turning it off and turning it on again. Um, unfortunately, that is still the recommended procedure. All right, uh, let me turn off my backup here so it's not creating an echo. I hope you can hear me well and we can get started in just a second. Uh, if I can get a thumbs up on screen from uh, maybe Labis to tell me that the sound and video is good, and then I will get started. Um, very good. Yes? Okay, everyone can hear me. Great, we've got some good questions today. Our first question comes from Carmen. Carmen asks about the adjustment of difficulty. How do we make sure that all the miners are using the same value of difficulty? How is this value shared with all the miners? I guess that the difficulty is calculated by checking the timestamp of block X, then the timestamp of block X plus 2016, uh, so uh, the span of time for the 2016 block interval called an epoch in Bitcoin, and comparing that to the expected time uh, that two weeks worth of blocks should take. This timestamp depends on the computer time, which is very easy to manipulate. Does this make it a weak point? All right, so let's go over this in a bit more uh, detail, starting with, generally speaking, when you ask a question about Bitcoin and you ask the question, is this a weak point of uh, Bitcoin? The, the simple answer is, no, it isn't a weak point of Bitcoin. And uh, we know that because um, any weak points in Bitcoin uh, can and will be exploited immediately. And if the system has survived for years, a decade now, without being exploited, then you can assume that it isn't a weak point. Of course, that doesn't change the question. If it's not a weak point, why is it not a weak point? How does the design of the system prevent this kind of manipulation? So the timestamp does depend on individual computer time, and that is very easy to manipulate. You can go into your computer, you can change the time on the clock, and then you can make it be whatever time, whatever year you want, and the computer will believe you. So it does not, obviously it does not depend on that. Also, because Bitcoin is a distributed system, and because that distributed system is distributed across a very large uh, geography, it is not possible to achieve clock synchronization. In fact, it's not even desirable to achieve clock synchronization. So by design, Bitcoin does not depend on the computer clocks being synchronized with perfect accuracy. Of course, there is no such thing as perfect accuracy but not even um, second accuracy. So, but yet the timestamps and the difficulty are computed using um, the timestamps within the blocks. And those are measured in milliseconds. Uh, specifically, they're measured in uh, Unix epoch, which is milliseconds from January 1st, 1970. And this is fairly standard for time measurements. This is a very common way that computers measure time as a number of milliseconds that have elapsed from uh, the specific uh, date, which is midnight on January 1st, 1970. 
Uh, and this is because Unix systems designed in the 70s were used that as the starting point. Um, so how does the system know that the timestamps that are in the block are accurate? Well, the reason that the system knows that the timestamps that are in blocks that have been mined and accepted by everyone are accurate is because one of the checks that every node in the network does on every block is whether the timestamp in that block is within a reasonable range. So, whenever a node receives a block, whether it's a node that's mining, or it's a node that's simply verifying, or it's a node that belongs to a merchant or an exchange or whoever, or the little node you're running at home on your Raspberry Pi, whenever it receives a block, uh, it will validate that block and it will do so by running a number of checks on that block. So it will compare certain parameters in the block. And these are the consensus rules. The consensus rules are essentially whether a block is valid or not based on running a whole number of tests on that block. One of those tests is, is the block timestamp within a reasonable range. Now your node needs to have its clock synchronized more or less to universal time and uh, not be deviating by a whole lot from that. And there's some wiggle room. And the wiggle room uh, is in the order of minutes in order to ensure that even if the timestamp is off for that uh, clock, it's not off by very much. So the timestamp that a miner puts in a block um, doesn't have to be perfectly exact. It cannot be perfectly exact. Um, but it does have to be within a range of the time. And it's not within 10 minutes. It's not that big of a range. I don't remember the exact, uh, the exact range. But it's basically calculated as an interval from the mean uh, block time of the recent past. So basically what happens is um, nodes count uh, the timestamp or the average time elapsed for the past several blocks. And if you produce a new block and you present it to the network, every node will check that its timestamp is within an expected uh, range. Um, so Ali um, asked a question here, which I'm going to just answer very quickly. We, uh, we do not go over the class materials unless there is a need to explain a particularly complex uh, topic. Instead, we go directly into answering questions. If, while answering these questions from the follow-ups, and the depth of the questions, I see that some topics require further explanation, then I will go over the class materials. But this uh, video session is not for uh, going over the class materials, Ali. All right, so how does the timestamp work within uh, the blocks? If the average block uh, the time uh, to find an average block is expected to be 10 minutes, then the elapsed time from the first block to the last block, 2016 blocks later, um, the elapsed time must be uh, 2016 blocks times 10 minutes each. Uh, the elapsed time for the epoch should be 20,160 minutes. So that's the um, benchmark, that's the baseline, that's the thing we're tuning against. So the entire Bitcoin system is uh, calibrating difficulty so that the average block time remains at 10 minutes. The static thing, the absolute thing in the system is the 10 minute block time, that's the target. The other parameters of the system are dynamic um, so that they adjust in order to calibrate the system to uh, reach 10 minutes per block, regardless of how many miners and how much hash power is being applied to uh, uh, block solving. Uh, 
right? So the static thing in the system is the 10 minute block. So when a node is looking at uh, difficulty, it's calculating based on an expectation of a 10 minute block. Let's explain this a bit more detail. And by the way, if you have questions that you need to ask, please keep them to the context of what we're talking about right now. If you ask questions out of sequence, I'm not gonna get to them until the end. Uh, and I probably won't see them uh, if you put them in the chat. Uh, put them in the Q&A, please, if they're not on the topic we're discussing right now. Olga asks a great question. Who's adjusting the system? Who is eventually behind the algorithm? And Mikhail asks, the Bitcoin client software is adjusting on each node. Um, and uh, yes, that is uh, correct. Every node runs this calculation. Uh, the algorithm, the um, arithmetic equation, if you like, for figuring out what the difficulty should be for each block is calculated independently by every participant in the system. So everyone uses the same mathematical equation to calculate the difficulty based on the last 2016 blocks that they have seen, and they do this calculation uh, with every block that comes in, and they adjust it once every 2016 blocks. And every 2016 blocks, you do this calculation to decide what the new difficulty would be, and that's the retargeting of the difficulty that happens every approximately two weeks. So every node does this. Well, Okay, but that sounds kind of chaotic. How does every node calculate the difficulty and why? how does the node arrive at the same answer? Um, how is this coordinated? It's not coordinated. The only element of coordination here is the blockchain itself. So there's two aspects to this calculation that produce a coordinated response. And the two aspects are this. The equation, the arithmetic calculation is the same for everyone. And that's simply built into the software. It is the algorithm. It is the consensus rules. And the consensus rules say that the difficulty should be adjusted based on a specific formula every 2016 blocks. That's the, and the equation for how to adjust the difficulty is the same. It's in the software. It's part of the consensus rules. Now, the input to this equation, the numbers that you plug in to get an answer, are drawn from the blockchain. And because the blockchain um, has been validated by everyone, um, the nodes that are doing this calculation, the majority of the network should be seeing the same uh, 2016 blocks as the most recent blocks. And they will do this calculation using the same input. So if you have an arithmetic equation, and you plug in the same numbers at the same time, more or less, you will get the same answer. And this is how each node does it. Each node is counting how many blocks have elapsed um, in general from Genesis. And so if you take the number of blocks that have elapsed from Genesis, from the first block, and you divide that by 2016, you can see how far into the current era you are. Uh, so let's say um, that uh, your uh, calculation dividing the current block number by 2016, you come up with an answer of 400.5. Well, that means you've had 400 eras and you're halfway through the, uh, the 401st era of 2016 blocks. So you know that there will be a difficulty retargeting when that number goes from 400 point something to 401. So when it's a whole number, when there's no remainder, when the division by 2016 blocks is exact, it's an integer, that means that you've reached the end of an era. The block that you're currently looking at, the newest block, is the 2016th block in the sequence, which means that it is the last block of that epoch. And that means that the next block will be the first block of the new epoch. Make sense? So if you're looking at blocks and you're counting how many you've had since Genesis, you know when you've completed the sequence of 2016 because you're counting. 
And therefore, all of the nodes, when they see that block, will realize that's the last block of the era. MZ is saying this is highly confusing without an illustration. Uh, I, I understand. It, it is uh, quite difficult to understand. Um, so can't really do an illustration for you, but I'll try to explain it in more detail. And if you find some aspect of this particularly confusing, if you can ask a follow-up question, maybe I can explain that particular part. So your, your node is receiving blocks, and it's counting blocks since the beginning. And um, once it has completed its uh, 2016 most recent blocks, once it's received the last of the 2016 blocks in the current era, it's going to recalculate the difficulty for the next block. And the way it's going to do that is it's going to count the timestamps from the first to the last block, all 2016, and it's going to calculate the average amount of time that each block took. 2016 blocks should take 20,160 minutes because 10 minutes per block. Um, and 2016 is an arbitrary figure, which is um, approximately two weeks if you have uh, blocks every 10 minutes. It's one of the parameters of Bitcoin built into the Bitcoin. All right. So if the time that has elapsed is more than 20,160 minutes, that means that it took longer than 10 minutes per block. And that means that uh, the difficulty needs to be reduced um, so that it's easier to find a block. And the percentage by which the difficulty needs to be reduced is linear. It's the ratio of how long it should have taken over how long it actually took. Um, so if, for example, instead of 20,000 blocks, uh, so 20,000 minutes, it was 22,000 minutes, then the difficulty will go down by about 10%. Uh, or the ratio of 22,000 over 20,000. Um, and if you think about it, if every node is taking the timestamps from the last 2016 uh, blocks, calculating the total amount of time that has elapsed um, and dividing 20,160 by that amount of time, they will get the same answer. They're all plugging the same numbers into the same equation. They're going to get the same answer. And that answer will be the new difficulty. Once they have that answer, they now know what they should expect the new difficulty to be in the next block. That expectation becomes part of their validation rules, meaning that when they receive the next block, if the difficulty isn't the number that they independently calculated, they reject that block. They say, nope, that's not correct. And because all of the nodes come up with the same answer on the same block for the next block, um, the miners also come up with the same answer, and they know that that's the difficulty they must target, and that's the difficulty they must put in their candidate block in order for that block to be accepted. They already know what the answer is supposed to be, and they know that they must fulfill that as part of the validation rules. If they produce a block that has a different difficulty, um, then that block is not valid. And as a result, they know that everyone will reject it. Right. So in a network with tens of thousands of nodes, some nodes, and when I say some, I mean a small percentage, maybe one or two percent of the nodes, may have different blocks um, because the blocks take a while to settle. Uh, there may be two blocks simultaneously. This is known as a fork, a consensus fork. And it happens from time to time. On average, every two weeks, um, two miners will produce two valid blocks almost simultaneously competing for the same slot. And some nodes in the network will see one solution and some will see the other. So it's not guaranteed that 100% of the nodes will have the exact same 2016 blocks to base their answer on. 
And there is a small possibility that some nodes will see a different block and have a different answer for difficulty, but that's fine. They will reject the next block and then the network will converge on the, let's say 98% of the blocks who got the right answer. And this kind of um, statistical approach to consensus, where consensus happens eventually through everyone applying the same rules, um, the same equation to the same source material or the same inputs and arriving at the same answer, this is game theory. Um, the, the game theory in this is simply that if you know that others are going to arrive at this answer and you know that your um, success in mining a block depends um, on reaching the same conclusion as everybody else through the same rules, then it is not in your interest to deviate from these rules because everybody else will reject your block. And so the game theory that comes in here is we all know what the answer should be because we've calculated it the same way and that results in us uh, playing to those rules out of self-interest if we're mining to make sure that, uh, that when we use the electricity to mine, we don't waste that electricity because we actually have a chance of our block being accepted. That's game theory. How does the network prevent tagging nodes that have two, uh, that have a different answer for this as traitors? Well, they're not tagged as uh, traitors. They, they simply um, will notice eventually that they are not, um, they, that their um, greatest difficulty chain is not the same as the other nodes in the network. And this is why um, you'll see things like uh, six confirmations being required before uh, a transaction is considered finalized, right? What do six confirmations mean? It means that enough time has passed that even if you had a divergence in the network over one block, um, that divergence will be fixed over two blocks because the chances of two blocks diverging in sequence are exponentially lower than the chance of a one block divergence in the network. The chance of a three block divergence is exponentially lower. Again, the chance of a four block divergence exponentially lower, et cetera, et cetera. By the time you get to six blocks, the chances of that happening purely out of chance are so low that you can consider it um, an anomaly that doesn't happen, right? In fact, if you look at the Satoshi white paper, there's only one mathematical equation in there, and that mathematical equation is, is calculating the probability of uh, exactly this. It's where the six blocks for confirmation comes. That is the only equation in the white paper, and it's an equation to calculate what is the probability of, um, uh, of the network diverging for a specific number of blocks. And so while one block divergence can happen, and in fact happens on average every two weeks, uh, a two block divergence happens on average uh, every few months, a three block divergence uh, does not happen. Uh, it, it simply has not happened in the network uh, without a bug in the system. And, um, and so that's how you statistically converge to the same answer and align the results of the network. Deborah has a follow-up question there. What is the interaction between a node and a miner? Uh, miners are nodes uh, also. They're just nodes that have a specialist function of, of at the same time hashing uh, with hashing machines in order to produce blocks. But miners run nodes too. And, uh, the interaction of all nodes with each other, whether they're miners or not, is the same. It is the Bitcoin protocol. They're basically uh, gossiping or telling each other about uh, primarily two things, transactions and blocks. Nodes announce to each other what transactions they've heard about and what blocks they've heard about. So the primary interaction between nodes is really telling each other about new blocks that they know about. So that when a miner finds a solution to a block and they tell uh, 
their node tells the other nodes um, that they're connected to, and those other nodes tell their neighbors, and those other nodes tell their neighbors, etc. That new block very quickly ripples out and propagates across the network, so that everyone in the network finds out about that block within within a few seconds. Everyone in the global network finds out. So the interaction between nodes, whether they're nodes that belong to miners or nodes that don't belong to miners, is the same. They're basically telling each other about new blocks that they know about. And by assembling each node, assembling and validating those blocks into a local copy of the blockchain, uh, they can all arrive at the same universal coordinated answer of what the truth is, um, which is recorded as the, as the blockchain. And they don't arrive at this universal truth immediately and perfectly synchronized. They may diverge for a short period of time uh, by one block. Uh, every two weeks on average. Less likely they will diverge by two blocks, um, but they won't diverge by more than that without effectively becoming completely desynchronized um, from the network. And that happens because of a bug in the node implementation. So a node may end up desynchronized with the blockchain because it has a bug and is not keeping up with the other nodes in terms of the consensus rules. All right, let's see if we have any more questions. This is a fairly difficult topic. It's a fairly advanced uh, topic, and we got into it pretty quickly. Um, all right, we have one question from Andy. Let's uh, see if we have any other uh, questions for follow-up. All right, so Andy asks uh, in the chat, how are one block divergences dealt with and um, and what happens, another follow-up from JD, what happens to the invalidated blocks transactions? So this particular scenario of one block divergences or even two or three um, is handled in exactly the same way um, and it is a normal function of consensus in the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, the specific example with diagrams can be found in my book, which is available online on GitHub. You can find it in Mastering Bitcoin, um, and it's called a consensus fork, and there's a diagram of what happens in a consensus fork. Um, I'm going to explain it uh, briefly here. So let's say that um, the uh, we have the blockchain that everybody... Uh, has recorded on their nodes up until this moment, everybody's agreed, and you have uh, b the block at height 800,000. Uh, so this is the 800,000th block, everybody's agreed on that. Now let's say that you, across the entire network there's miners in different countries. Let's say there's a miner in the US, and let's say there's another miner in Australia. They've both received block 800,000, they've both accepted it, validated it, and added it to their blockchain. And so the moment they received and validated that block, they both started the race. And the race is to produce block 800,001, right? They're both trying to produce block 800,001. To do so, they construct locally a candidate block. Their node builds a candidate block, sticks a bunch of transactions into that candidate block so they can earn some fee, um, puts in the timestamp and the previous block, the hash of the block 800,000, its parent, um, and they put the other information into the candidate block, and then they start hashing to see if they can very quickly find a solution. Now, let's say that by complete coincidence, they both find a solution um, more or less simultaneously, or let's say within five seconds of each other, right? Um, that's when a consensus fork happens. In the normal uh, operation of the network, because this is a game of chance, because it's based on probabilities, a miner will find a solution and no one else will find a solution at the same exact moment. And then the moment they find the solution, they tell everyone about it. And within five to seven seconds, it propagates across the entire global network. And at that point, if you're another miner who's mining for the same block and you see that someone else has found a block, you stop. You validate it, 
and then you start looking for the next block. There's no point in competing if you've lost the race. When you see a block, you know you've lost the race, so you want to start the next race as quickly as possible. So the only chance of this happening is if in the time it would take to propagate this block across the entire network, two miners actually find by coincidence a block at the same time, and they're in network terms far from each other. Um, so they don't tell each other immediately. They tell the nodes around them. Those nodes tell their neighbors who tell their neighbors who tell their neighbors. And Ali says, isn't it supposed to be broadcast publicly the nonce to get 51% votes to add it onto the blockchain? There isn't a voting process. And broadcast publicly on Bitcoin simply means your node tells your node's neighbors. The average node is connected to eight other nodes and it tells its eight neighbors, hey, I found a block, that's broadcast. It's only broadcast to eight nodes. Those eight nodes are connected to eight other nodes each. So then each of them goes, hey, someone found a block. And then it propagates out. Now, within two hops, you've got eight times eight, 64 nodes uh, that now know about this block. And then each one of those nodes is connected to eight others. So times eight again. And this is called uh, flooding or gossip. And very quickly, the, the block propagates, it explodes outwards from the point of origin. And because everybody's telling their neighbors as quickly as they can, um, it will ripple out across the network until it reaches all nodes. And, you know, 10, 20,000 nodes around the world uh, with network delays and latencies, it might take, I, I gave a number before, five to 10 seconds. It's usually less than 10 seconds for that block to propagate to everyone. So that's what we mean when we say broadcast publicly. So now imagine the scenario that you have the Australian miner and the US miner, and they both find a solution for a block at height 800,001. Um, and they're both valid. They're both correct. They've both been correctly mined, they both have transactions in them, or maybe they don't because they didn't have time to put transactions in them yet. And as soon as they find it, they tell their neighbors. So you have these two points that announce blocks. And those neighbors then tell their neighbors, who tell their neighbors. And as you can imagine, if this is in a network that's spread out geographically, and the, the connections of course don't follow geography, um, but the network is still spread out. There is a scenario where maybe about half the nodes will hear about the Australian block first, and half the nodes on the network will hear the American node, right? At that point, you have... Uh, a consensus fork because all of the ones that hear about the Australian node first think that it won. And all of the ones that hear, hear about the American block first think that it won the race. And, and for, for a moment, the network is split into two opinions about which node won. Well, all of the miners who heard the American block first will start trying to build block 800,002 on top of the American block 800,001. Whereas all of the uh, miners who heard the Australian block 800,001 will start building their 800,002 block on top of the Australian uh, block. So now you have two solutions, two 800,001 position blocks built on the same parent. And on Miners on two different sides of the network will try to extend these two chains, right? Who's going to win? So if the one building on top of the American block finds a solution first and tells everyone about it, then that chain wins. Effectively, then, the chain that had the Australian block is no longer the valid chain, and that Australian block gets invalidated. Um, 
And essentially, the American bloc won the race in retrospect, and we only find that out um, one block later. And the reason uh, the American bloc won is because it was in the chain that got built after the American bloc. Um, and therefore, it becomes the longest, uh, greatest cumulative difficulty chain. And so that results in solving the disagreement. Now, is there a possibility, a very small possibility, that this whole scenario plays again? There is a possibility that when half the network is trying to build on the American block and half the network is trying to build on the Australian block, that again, by coincidence, two miners who are seeing different chains find a valid block for position 800,002 at the same time and then broadcast it, creating again um, a split in the chain. Now, that would be a two-block divergence, but it would require that you have the coincidence of almost simultaneous block discovery for block 800,001, followed by the coincidence of almost simultaneous discovery of block 800,002 built on top of the different original chains. And that probability is exponentially lower. So that doesn't happen very often. Whereas the finding two blocks simultaneously happens on average once every two weeks. Um, the finding of uh, uh, two blocks and then another two blocks almost simultaneously building two chains uh, across a two block divergence uh, happens once every several months uh, on average. And we, we don't really see it uh, in the chain very often. The probability says once every seven months, but um, it, it may, uh, th that doesn't mean that it happens. Um, now, a block of uh, a block divergence of three blocks is even less likely because you, you have to have a coincidence on top of a coincidence on top of a coincidence, a low probability event, followed by another low probability event, followed without interruption by another prob low probability event. And if you keep these probabilities are multiplied by each other, right? So let's say there is a um, there's approximately a one in 2,000 block chance of finding uh, a block simultaneously. So that's a, a one divided by 2,000 probability. If you want to look at a two block divergence, then that's a one over 2,000 multiplied by a one over 2,000 probability. And because the probabilities are multiplied, um, you have this exponentially uh, more and more unlikely event. Okay, were you able to understand that? Very good. I have one more follow-up question. I haven't forgotten about it. What happens to the transactions in the rejected block? All right. So now let's talk about what happens to transaction in the rejected block. Not much, and don't worry about it. So the Australian block lost the race. It didn't lose it immediately. For a while, lots of nodes on the network thought that the Australian block was winning. But then when the other block came out um, and it had as its parent the American block, everybody discovers, OK, maybe the Australian block didn't win the race. And so the Australian block is discarded. What happens when it's discarded is its transactions go back in the mempool to be validated again. So they were confirmed and then they're unconfirmed. Now, when you're looking at a block explorer, you're looking at a web view of the network, you may actually see this and it confuses a lot of people. They're looking at the wallet and they're looking at the transaction and they're waiting, zero confirmations, unconfirmed, 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 unconfirmed. Like, when is this transaction going to go through? Did I put enough fee? Oh my God, I'm waiting and waiting. It's taken 20 minutes already, et cetera, et cetera. And then suddenly they see, oh, one confirmation. And what do you expect to happen after one confirmation? You expect that now it's inevitable that after 10 minutes, it's gonna say two confirmations. And then to your shock and horror, you go from one confirmation 
to unconfirmed again. You're thinking, how is this possible? How did my transaction become confirmed and then become unconfirmed? And the answer from a technical perspective is your transaction was in the Australian block. And for a moment, your wallet and any nodes that it was talking to thought that the Australian block had won the race. And for the next 10 minutes until the next block came out, they thought it was confirmed. But then they found out that in fact, the Australian block was invalidated. And then your transaction goes back in the mempool and is now unconfirmed. You haven't paid a fee. You haven't transacted. Your transaction simply has not happened because the truth of what has happened and hasn't happened is the blockchain that most people agree on. And that blockchain doesn't have the Australian block in it. It only has the American block in it. The Australian block appeared and then disappeared. And it's as if it never happened. Now, in practice, things are even less complicated than that. So it gets parked, as Gaston says, until the next block. It goes back into the queue, right? It goes back into the queue. Um, it hasn't happened. It hasn't paid a fee. The money hasn't left the wallet. It's still waiting unconfirmed in the queue. So you can have a scenario where you think a transaction is confirmed and then you discover it actually wasn't. And this is the reason why an exchange will say, no, you need six confirmations or maybe three confirmations. Or a merchant will say, I'm not shipping you a TV until your transaction has um, three confirmations. Uh, why? Because one can happen and then unhappen, right? One doesn't tell me anything. Um, there is a probability that that one block will get invalidated or orphaned, as it's known. Now, in practical terms, um, things are a bit simpler. And, and the reason they're simpler is this. When the American miner and the Australian miner were constructing their candidate block and they were putting transactions into their candidate block, where are they getting those transactions from? They're getting them from the mempool. And how are they deciding which transactions to put into their candidate block? Because the mempool has a lot of transactions. Maybe the mempool has 20, 30,000 transactions, um, but the block will only fit 2,000 transactions. Well, the miners are using their software is picking from the mempool the most profitable transactions. So they're sorting them by uh, Satoshis per byte, by fee, to decide if they're going to include them in the block. And they're taking the most profitable Satoshi per byte transactions off the top. They're skimming the top of the mempool, right? The, the, the creme de la creme, the best transactions, the most profitable ones. This is how the mempool works. It's a queue um, which works more like an auction, right? You're bidding with your fee to get into the next block. Now, if you think about it, their mempool in the American miners node and the mempool in the Australian miners node, they're going to be 99% the same. Why? Because as I mentioned before, transactions and blocks get propagated. It takes about five seconds for a transaction to propagate across the entire worldwide network. So if you uh, transmit a transaction, if you broadcast the transaction onto the blockchain, it's going to be in all of the miners' mempools within five seconds. And the miners are going to sort the transactions by most profitable in the same exact way. They may receive one transaction before another, and then another miner may receive them in the opposite sequence, but the mempools are going to be 99% similar. And because they're selecting the most profitable transactions off the top of the mempool, the transactions that they choose to put in their blocks are also going to be 99% similar. So the truth is that even though the Australian block got invalidated, there's a very good chance that 99% of the transactions in it, which is, you know, out of 2,000 transactions, uh, 1,980 transactions, are going to be identical and therefore they're going to be in the American block that won the race. So even though the Australian block got invalidated, 
90% of its transactions are already in the other block. So they got confirmed anyway. So the Australian block lost. The miner lost the reward, but 90% of its transactions, 99% of its transactions, in fact, are going to be also in the American block. So when your node sees that the Australian block is invalidated and it goes to put the transactions back in the mempool so that they can wait in queue, it first checks, okay, this transaction in here that was in the invalid Australian block, has it already been confirmed in the, in the other blockchain? Oh, it has. Okay, so I don't need to put this in the mempool. This is already confirmed. Ignore it. Ignore it, ignore it, ignore it, ignore it, ignore it. And 99% of them, they're just going to ignore them. They don't go back in the mempool in practice because they're actually in the other block. So they're fine. Um, and what gets retransmitted into the mempool, what gets dumped back into the mempool, are probably the transactions that had a lower fee per byte and because there's a lot of those, that's where there's going to be a difference in the block. Uh, if you're thinking about the mempool and it has 30,000 transactions, you know, um, the top 1,000 transactions or so are paying a significant premium in their fees to get in to the next block. And those are going to be in both the Australian and the American block, no question about it. Once you get past the first... Uh, thousand or so transactions, then you're going to find a lot of transactions, hundreds, thousands of transactions that are more or less at the same level of fee per byte. And therefore, choosing which one you put in your block is no longer a matter of which one is more profitable because they're all equally profitable. You're now looking at 3,000 transactions, all of which pay 25 Satoshis per byte, which are at the top of the mempool. And how, which, which of these do you choose? You only have maybe, let's say, 800 um, transactions to fill in the block, and you have 3,000 transactions all paying the same fee. How do you choose them? Well, in that case, the mempool essentially becomes a first-come, first-serve, and the miners will pick the transactions they saw first. And because of timing differences in the network, that's where you're going to have discrepancies, where some miners may see... Uh, some transactions before others. Um, and that's why the blocks are not 100% identical between the two uh, different miners. Uh, Andreas, no, we're not going through the content right now. We're going through the questions. You uh, receive the content for each week, a week in advance, and you have time to go through the content on your own and ask clarifying questions. Right now, we're going through those clarifying questions. To, uh, to clarify the understanding of people who have already read the content. This is not a lecture on the content, just to clarify. And Gaston, as you ask, uh, low fee transactions take longer to validate. Absolutely, exactly. Well, low fee transactions may never get included in a block. Uh, if they don't get included in a block after about three days or 72 hours, most miners simply drop them from their mempool and then unless the wallet retransmits them, uh, they get off the, the mempool. All right. Um, I'm going to take a brief uh, break here because I've just discovered that my laptop power supply is not charging. And that will result in me running out of power halfway through the video if I don't fix it. Give me one minute. 
All right. Um, let's do a quick check to make sure that you can hear me again. I am now speaking through a different microphone and on a different uh, camera. I apologize for this. We've got some technical problems. All right, my laptop decided it doesn't want to charge. So it's now put me on a countdown. And I found in the past that the only way to fix this is to reboot, which is what I'm going to do while I talk to you on this second device because um, smart people in technology have a backup plan and they don't trust that the technology will simply work when it's expected to work. So that's where we are now. All right, uh, if all goes well, I'll continue with these questions. Um, we have gone through some uh, uh, great, uh, yes, and test first. Yes, I, I actually did test that everything was working up until about 10 minutes before we started the video and then things started getting weird on my uh, laptop. All right, we have some additional questions from the forums. So now that we've covered some of these things about difficulty, these are always difficult topics to understand um, because it's a lot of complicated, um, uh, complicated topics. Uh, and certainly the first time you hear about this, it can be very, very confusing. It took me about a year to understand mining, uh, really to an, a nuanced understanding of mining. And I'm still learning more. Uh, all the time in order to enhance my understanding. So don't be upset or worried if you don't grasp this immediately without asking clarifying questions or that you read it and it doesn't really gel or make sense or click in your head. This is normal. This is part of how um, this topic uh, is taught. Unfortunately, it takes a while to understand these things. Gustavo asks about discovering a new block. After the block is resolved, there is a match with the expected pattern of the hash. What is this expected pattern? So you may have heard that a, a, a block's hash must match the difficulty pattern. What is the difficulty pattern? The difficulty pattern is simply uh, this. The hash of the block must have a certain number of leading zeros. Now, pick any of your favorite um, block explorers, right? Um, Bitcoin block explorers. You could use, let's say, blockchain.info or blockstream.info and go look at the latest um, block on the chain. Now, if you look at that block, um, somewhere in those details, probably at the top of the page, you're going to see a block hash. You're going to see the hash of that block um, shown to you uh, as a hexadecimal number. It's going to be a very long number, 256 uh, bits. So that's uh, 64 hexadecimal characters. And uh, when you look at that, you're going to notice something. You're going to notice that the first 18 or so hexadecimal characters are zeros. And it's going to be a very obvious pattern. So the block hash will be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 18 zeros, and then A, B, C, D, E, F, 1, 3, 2, 1, 5, 3, F, F, E, E, C, C, B, B, whatever. Um, and it's basically a random number uh, in that that hash was derived from a hash function, which means that it randomly ended up having 18 leading zeros. What are the chances of a number having uh, 18 leading zeros when you're picking this random this number randomly? Well, you can actually uh, calculate that, right? You can calculate that probability. So if you produce a hash, what are the chances that the first hexadecimal digit is uh, zero? Well, the first, the first digits in that hash can be anything from zero to um, F, 
It can be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. So hexadecimal numbers are 16, right? Um, base 16. That's what hexadecimal means. It means base 16. So that means that every digit represents 16 values, values 0 through 9 and A through F. So if you're producing a number randomly, the chance of uh, the first digit of that number being a specific digit is simply the probability equal to being any digit, right? So uh, the, the first digit has a 1 in 16 chance of being 0, a 1 of 16 chance of being 1, a 1 of 16 chance being A, a 1 of 16 chance being E, a 1 of 16 chance being 7. All of the digits have an equal probability. And because the total number is 16 digits that, and they have an equal probability, then the probability is 1 over 16, 1 16th chance. Great. So now you know if you're producing hashes randomly, the chance of um, the first digit being zero is one in 16. That means that on average, if you produce 16 hashes in a row, one of them will start with zero. It's like throwing dice, right? What is the chance of uh, your dice landing as a six? Well, it's one in six. Uh, this is a dice that simply has 16 sides. So if you throw it, you have a one in 16 chance of it being zero which is one of the possible values. Okay, so far so good. Does everybody understand this? All right. All right, now maybe you can work it out for me. What is the chance of both the first two digits being zero in a hash if you're picking them randomly? So what is the chance of it starting with zero, zero in hex? Well, the first digit is one in 16. The, first di the second digit is also one in 16. So it's one in 16 times one over 16 which is one over 16 squared. Do you see how the difficulty plays out? Now, think about what are the chances of randomly picking a number that has 18 zeros in a row? Well, that's one over 16 to the power of 18. That is a very big number. That is the difficulty. In practice, that is the difficulty. So if you think of the hash as the universe of all possible numbers that have 256 binary digits or 64 hexadecimal digits, every time you put a constraint that the first digits, the first 18 digits have to be zero, you're basically lowering the bar. And in order for it to be uh, a valid hash, the miner has to, um, while striking randomly across the entire range of numbers, come under the bar. Increasing the difficulty means squeezing, squeezing the amount of available answers that are actually valid and making more and more of the available answers invalid. So any number that comes out of the hash that doesn't have 18 zeros in the beginning is invalid. Well, that significantly reduces how many of the results of your hash are going to be valid. You've squeezed the results and made it more and more difficult to find one by chance. And how do you find one by chance when the chance is one over 16 to the power of 18? You do 16 to the power of 18 consecutive hash operations on the same candidate block and hope that by chance, one of them is in that range of probabilities. That's how the expected pattern works. That's how difficulty works. Um, and that's how um, you can validate that a block was found uh, with the hashes actually being done. Because there's no way to find a nonce that will produce a hash with this uh, ridiculous property that the first 18 digits is zero, or whatever the current difficulty is, you know that the only way mathematically that they could have done it is by doing 16 to the power of 18 numbers of hashes consecutively on the same exact block header in order to find one by chance. Um, that proves that they did the work, right? So that pattern 
which you can replicate. You can take the block header, you can plug in the nonce that the miner has found, you can hash it, and the result you're going to get is a hash with 18 zeros in the beginning. And you know there's no way they could have done this other than plugging in nonces nonstop until eventually, after doing approximately 16 to the power of 18 hashes, they accidentally stumbled on one that had 18 zeros in the beginning, which means that the block hash itself is proof that they did the work, which is why we call it proof of work. So simply seeing this hash and, and being able to calculate it in the same way that the miner did tells you that the only way they could have produced this is by doing all of these hashes. And you know how many hashes they had to do because you can calculate the probability. And so you know how much hash power has gone into this. You know how difficult it is. And you know the only way they would do it is by doing the work. Gustavo has a follow-up question about hash functions. From what I understand, the hash function has no return after decoding. If the block is the previous block plus the candidate block plus the nonce, how do you query the transactions and look for them within the blocks? Um, I'm going to rephrase this a bit because I think I understand what Gustavo is trying to say. And what Gustavo is saying is that SHA-256 is a one-way hash. So you, once you have the hash, the, you can't go back to what the block was to, to confirm what it contained. No, you can't go back, but what you can do is you can calculate the hash again. So when a, a miner announces the block, they don't just announce the nonce. They announce the entire block header that contains the nonce inside it. And the way you know it's a valid block is because if you take that block header that contains the nonce, that contains the previous block, that contains the timestamp, that contains the Coinbase transaction, that contains the Merkle root of the transaction, the, the header contains 80 bytes of data in a specific data structure that describes the block, including the nonce. If you take those 80 bytes and you plug them into SHA-256, you're going to come out with this hash that has 18 zeros in the beginning. So you now know that the only way they could have produced that is this block header is the one they validated. They can't produce a block header and predict what the hash is. So the only way they could have done it is by plugging in uh, quadrillions of nonces until they got a result that gave them this hash. So while you can go backwards on the hash, you can repeat the hashing function. And effectively, that's almost like a signature. It proves that this is, in fact, the block that they hashed and that they did the work. If you know this is the block that they hashed, they've locked in, they've committed with this nonce and this hash, they've committed to everything that's in the block header, including the Merkle root. Because the Merkle root is produced by the tree of all of the transactions, you can prove that a transaction was part of this calculation by calculating the Merkle root from all of the transactions and seeing that that is, in fact, the Merkle root that's in the block header. And that block header cannot be modified um, because it's the only block header that produces this magical hash result. Uh, so effectively, and we call these digital commitments, effectively, the nonce that produces the magical hash, that produces the hash with 18 zeros, commits the entire block header and all of its contents in such a way that it cannot be changed. If you change a single bit in that block header, it will produce a different block hash. And that block hash, I can guarantee you, will not have 18 leading zeros because out of the quadrillions of hashes that were tried, all of them did not have 18 leading zeros except for one, <laughs> the one that's valid. Um, so that guarantees that you can't change anything in the block header. It's being committed to, it's locked in place. And so are all of the transactions because they're locked into the Merkle root. So you commit to the header, which commits to the Merkle root, which commits to the whole tree, which commits to every transaction. Um, and so that's how you know which transactions um, are included in the block. 
Now, uh, the miner doesn't just transmit the header, they also transmit uh, the transactions that are included in it so that you don't have to go and try and find by guessing which transactions were in it. So you can uh, simply validate rather than research and discover this answer. Um, but the proof is in the hash. All right, we're gonna keep the questions in the chat to the topic we're currently discussing uh, because otherwise um, I'm never going to get through all of the questions that we have for today. Pardon me one second, I'm still trying to troubleshoot the problem with my power supply. All right. Okay, you wanna hear something funny? The, um, the extension cord has a switch on it and at some point I must have kicked it and the switch was off, which goes back to troubleshooting step number one, is it plugged in? Um, now I was more focused on you and answering these questions to ask myself the question, is it plugged in? Uh, but I may have saved myself a lot of time had I asked that question and checked the extension cord. Uh, turns out you don't need a master's degree in computer science to solve that problem, uh, but it helps. You, you may now laugh at me. It's okay, I earned that one. Jimmy asks about Bitcoin versus consumption. We understand that to be profitable is to mine many blocks, but in this new energy crisis, even with the latest materials, is there an unbalanced decentralization method for trusted nodes? Um, no, there isn't, um, because the mining difficulty depends on how many people are participating. And that depends on how many people find it profitable to participate, which depends on the current price of Bitcoin, the current price of a kilowatt of energy, and the efficiency of your hashing. You can actually model this in a spreadsheet, right? Um, these are all fundamental um, units. And these fundamental units you can calculate yourself. So if you take one of the latest, greatest, most recent um, mining rigs, right? You can look at the most recent model of, let's say, an ant miner. I don't know what which one that is. Um, the S24, I would guess. So let's say there's an S24 model of the ant miner. Um, and this is basically a hardware box about the size of a shoe box with some giant fans on the front. Uh, and it contains application-specific integrated circuits that do hashing. And what's the important number of this particular um, mythical mining equipment, right? Um, if you look at the tech specs of this mining equipment, one of the most important numbers you're going to see is uh, an efficiency number, which is measured as terahashes per joule. So terahashes is, is a number of hashes, right? Tera being the um, metric prefix for trillion and um, and uh, hashes being SHA-256 double hashes. S21 is the last one? Okay, great, they haven't updated since then. I thought they named them after the years. So I'm, I'm creating a fictional one called the S24. It's the one you should have, it's the latest and greatest. So you can look at this efficiency and say, okay, um, joule is a unit of energy. So that's equivalent to um, watts consumed. So it can say, basically this is a machine that converts electricity into hashes. You plug it in, it uses electricity, and it can produce a specific number of hashes for every unit of energy that it consumes. And of course the international standard metric way of measuring energy is joules, but you can convert that into watts. So you have the efficiency of the equipment. Now, then there's another very important factor, which is how much does it cost to buy electricity in your area, 
or with the contract you have with the electricity company. So let's say, for example, in your area, uh, your electricity company charges you uh, five cents, so five hundredths of a dollar per kilowatt hour. So that's for an hour of drawing a kilowatt. One kilowatt per hour will cost you, let's say, five cents per kilowatt hour. And that's usually the metric that we use to measure energy cost. So you can then calculate how much is it going to cost me in, in dollars for every terahash of hashing that um, my machine is producing. And then you can calculate the, um, the probability of that amount of terahashes getting you a block. So how often will you get a block? Or how many hours, on average, would you have to mine at that terahash in order to earn a reward? Um, and if you're doing it by yourself, you have to actually find a block. If you're doing it as part of a pool, you contribute your hashes, and as long as the um, as long as the pool finds uh, a block, you get a share of that reward. Therefore, you can calculate whether it is profitable whether the uh, probability of you finding a block uh, and the amount of money you pay in electricity and the reward that you get is, um, is worth it, right? Yes, sorry, uh, someone clarified uh, Joules is watts per hour. Yes, which corresponds to the kilowatt per hour, which is what you pay your electricity company five cents for. So it's it's actually energy flow. It's not uh, energy level. Um, so you can calculate if this is profitable or not. Does this make sense? Every miner makes this profitability calculation every time, every day for every block. And miners are not universally profitable, meaning that if you're a miner and you have a thousand mining machines, they're not all going to be the mythical S24 with the highest level of efficiency. You're probably going to have three different generations of machines. You're constantly buying newer, more efficient machines with your profit, but you're not turning off or throwing away the old machines as long as they're still working and as long as they're still profitable. So you're trying to use as many machines as possible, and you're going to end up within your factory, for example, having maybe two, maybe three generations of machines. So is it profitable is not a question that you ask simply overall for the entire mining industry or even within a miner for all of the equipment in the entire business. Of course, you ask that question, but you ask it more on the specific machine. So you can say, is this machine profitable during this difficulty period? And, and based on the answer, you decide whether you leave that machine on or off. Um, if it's not profitable in the current difficulty period, you may decide it's not worth it and you turn that machine off. You don't turn all of the machines off because maybe 10% you know, of your machines are not profitable, but 90% of them are profitable because they're a newer generation, more efficient machine. Or you may decide you're not turning it off because the contract you have for next month is cheaper for your electricity costs with your current provider. Um, or you may decide that it's only cheaper at night, so you run that miner at night and you turn it off during the daytime. So there's all of these calculations. And based on these calculations, every single miner decides how many machines they're running and which machines they're running on any day. Across the industry now, you're going to have miners who have equipment in different countries. They're going to have equipment with different contracts, with different electricity providers at different prices. So they're all making these decisions, and they may be coming out with different answers. At any moment in time, it may become unprofitable for, let's say, 20% of the miners to continue to operate 20% of their equipment. So what they're going to do is they're going to turn off that equipment. And as a result, what's going to happen is the total amount of hash power on the network will go down, which will make it unprofitable um, 
which because it's unprofitable for these miners, they're not going to mine with that equipment. When the hash rate goes down, blocks will start coming out slower. So I, I remember on the chat, someone mentioned that the current block issuance rate is approximately 16 minutes on average. What does that mean? That means that um, the difficulty is too high. And the reason the difficulty is too high is because it became unprofitable for enough miners to turn off enough equipment that they're not um, achieving the target 10 minutes per block. In the next target, uh, in the next difficulty targeting period, that means the difficulty is going to go down. And if you're saying it's 16 minutes when it should be 10, um, that means there's going to be a 60% reduction of difficulty, right? Uh, or no, not a 60%, sorry. Uh, um, a 50% reduction in uh, difficulty to get it back to the target, right? So that from 16 minutes, it will go down to 10. So what does it mean to be profitable to mining? Um, at any moment in time, some miners are profitable and some miners are not profitable. And therefore, um, there is no, it is profitable or not profitable to mine Bitcoin as a general answer, because it depends on so many factors that vary from one miner to the next, from one machine to the next, from one region to the next, from one electricity contract to the next, from one hour to the next, depending on variable electricity rates. So at any moment in time, it will be very profitable for some and unprofitable for others. And the dynamics of this market will force those who find it unprofitable to turn off their equipment so as not to incur the electricity costs. And that's how the whole system dynamically adjusts um, based on the current price of Bitcoin and the difficulty. All right. Jason asks, Bitcoin relevance in 2140. Miners Bitcoin rewards decrease after every 210,000 blocks mined in an event called the Bitcoin halving. And by 2140, miners will rely solely on transaction fees. Although it's a long way off, I wonder if by that time, Bitcoin will still be relevant. It's important to understand how this works, Jason, so you can understand that this is not a process that happens in 2140. This is a process that has been happening since 2009. And the whether miners uh, rely solely on transaction fees is something that changes, just like we just discussed with profitability, all the time. The amount of fees that miners can collect in a block uh, changes uh, all the time, depending on the capacity of the network and how much people are bidding and how much activity there is. Um, a lot about whether there's excitement in the market and there's lots of transactions hitting the blockchain because people are trying to buy or sell Bitcoin. So that drives a lot of transaction fee activity. There are times when the blockchain has few transactions because uh, people are not actively engaging. And there are other times when it's crazy busy and you can't get a transaction without paying a very high fee. Um, but already, uh, you can see that very often the amount of fees collected exceed the block subsidy reward, which means that miners already rely substantially on fees. And on some days they rely on fees more than they rely on block subsidy. Or they get their profit more on fees than they do from block subsidy. So this is not something that happens suddenly in 2140. It's something that is already happening now. And it's a very gradual transition. With every halving, the needle shifts more and more and more to fees. Um, and miners adjust their profitability calculations based on that. And if they find themselves to be unprofitable, they turn off their equipment. And when they turn off the equipment, the difficulty goes down. And the other miners who did not turn off their equipment because they were barely profitable before now become more profitable 
uh, because there's less competition. So it dynamically adjusts. There will always be miners who are profitable um, at some level within the network. This isn't a scenario where all of the miners decide suddenly they're not profitable and turn everything off. That simply doesn't happen. And it's also not a scenario that happens in 2140. Okay, um, we now have another question about, um, let me see if I have any other uh, follow-up questions. All right. Um, next, I'm going to answer, I think we only have a few more minutes to go. So I'm going to answer a question about the mempool. Um, Tobias asked, how does the mempool for Bitcoin transactions work? Where are the transactions stored until they are confirmed? Can transactions expire or be dropped from the mempool? Thank you. So the most important thing to understand about the mempool is that there's no such thing as the mempool. There are many mempools. Every node has a mempool. And there is no the mempool. There is no central mempool. The mempool is simply a memory database. That's why it's called a mempool, because in the early versions of Bitcoin, these transactions were stored in memory, uh, in RAM. Um, in some Bitcoin implementations, uh, these may be stored in the database um, on a hard drive. Um, but effectively, the, there is no such thing as the mempool. There is a mempool. My node, uh, I'm actually running the node um, right now here um, on this laptop. I, I was until I had to boot it again. Um, my node has a mempool. It has its own mempool. And it stores all of the transactions that it sees that haven't been confirmed. So it has 30,000 transactions in its mempool. I can tweak the parameters of my node. I can change the settings in its configuration. And I can say, keep a mempool of no more than um, you know, 100 megabytes or 500 megabytes or gigabytes. I can also tell it, uh, don't store anything in the mempool if it has less than this much fee. I can also tell it how long to keep transactions in the mempool. So I can say, if after 72 hours, transactions are not confirmed, drop them. So I can set the timeout of my mempool. Now, my node has a mempool. And the reason my node has a mempool is so that it can use that to validate blocks. When it sees a new block, it needs to know um, which transactions are included in that block. And it needs to be able to validate all of the transactions in a block because if a block contains an invalid transaction, it's an invalid block. It's only a valid block if all of the transactions in it are also themselves valid. So in validating a block, my node also needs to validate every transaction that's in it. And it continuously keeps track of those transactions way before they appear in a block. It keeps track of them in the mempool and it broadcasts and receives transactions from other nodes constantly as these are sent out over the network. So my node's mempool is there so that my node can validate blocks. Now, if I was running a miner, then my mempool would also be used to validate blocks, obviously a very important function for miners because if they, they must rely on valid blocks, otherwise they're wasting their time. But if I'm a miner, my mempool serves another function. It, it's the bucket from which I scoop transactions to fill my candidate block. So when I build my nice candidate block over here and it's empty, I take my big, transaction scoop and I dip it in the mempool and I put those transactions in the block. Uh, of course, you know, this happens because my node goes into the mempool and uses an algorithm to select the most profitable transactions off the top and gradually fill up the block, the candidate block, while I'm mining it. Um, so um, 
that mempool has two functions. It's for validating blocks that I see other people finding, but it's also to help me construct a candidate block by giving me transactions that I can put into the block that I've already validated. So I know they're valid. I'm not going to accidentally put an invalid transaction in the block by keeping track of what's confirmed and what's unconfirmed and by giving me basically a pool of transactions that pay fees that I can sort by most profitable so that I'm ready to construct my candidate block. When you go online and you go to a website that is uh, like mempool.space that shows you the mempool, um, they're not showing you some universal mempool or some central mempool. They're simply showing you the mempool that that node that you've just connected to with your, with your browser has kept. And that mempool is going to be, as I mentioned before, 99% similar to the mempool that your node has. Um, and it's just a convenience web interface so you can peek into the mempool. And you know the most useful function that provides is it gives you an idea of how much people are bidding in terms of fees so that you can see what you need to put as a fee in order to get your transaction successfully confirmed soon. Transactions don't expire per se. Once a transaction has been created and signed, theoretically, it could be confirmed anytime um, uh, in the mempool. It never expires. Uh, it is always valid forever. There's no time stamp in it. There's no expiration date on it. It doesn't go stale. Uh, unless it's replaced by another transaction that spends the same inputs, in which case it's no longer a valid transaction because um, it cannot spend those coins because they've already been spent. It's a double spend. But transactions don't expire. And therefore, if they stayed in the mempool forever, uh, that would be very inconvenient because your wallet would not be able to, uh, for example, replace the transaction with a higher fee unless you've set that transaction to be replaceable. Um, so for convenience, um, and so as not to have to keep a massive mempool with hundreds of gigabytes worth of transactions, most nodes configure their mempool to be limited to a certain size, and they reject transactions below a certain fee or free transactions with no fee. Um, and they expire transactions themselves by dropping them from the mempool after a certain uh, period of time. That's not because the transaction has expired. It's because I don't want it in my mempool anymore, taking up space. If it hasn't been confirmed after three days, I'm assuming that the fee in it was too low to get confirmed. Uh, and it probably won't get confirmed for a much longer period of time. So I'm going to drop it. And uh, the person who created that transaction can decide to create it again um, and, and get it confirmed with a higher fee. All right, things have gotten quiet in the chat. I just wanted to check that you can still hear me. Uh, no one has said anything for a while. Yes, very good, excellent. That was the last question we have time for today. So to remind you about how we do the logistics of this uh, session, I generally don't spend time teaching the material that's in your slides. And the primary reason I don't do that is because that wastes your time. And it also um, means that the people who actually spend time studying the material asking questions and preparing for this session get cheated because then they just watch me for 30 minutes uh, reading the material that they've already had for a week that they should have studied. Uh, so unfortunately, I'm not going to be doing lecture style of the previous material. I think my time is much better used clarifying and answering questions and explaining things if you have, and then reacting in real time to, oh, I think I understood this, but is this what you meant? Or can you clarify this tiny detail? It might bring out new questions and that's how we get to clarity. And that's what I'm going to be doing. Uh, that means sometimes I'm going to be waving my hands a lot and trying to explain things with metaphors and, um, and uh, analogies. Um, so in order to prepare for this class, uh, now that you know, 
study the material when it comes out. You should have the material for next week today. Uh, and then after you've studied the material, go into the Moodle, into the forums and ask questions and see if you can figure it out with your colleagues, the other students who are taking this. Many students take this two or three times, so they maybe have seen these questions before. Maybe they can give you a straightforward answer right away. And then we collect all of the, all of the questions that haven't been answered and uh, I will answer them at the end of the week. So I'm gonna see you next Thursday, same time for session three. Thank you so much for attending today. My apologies for some of the technical uh, problems. Uh, hopefully we made up the time and um, we didn't lose anything. Uh, all right, have a great weekend, everyone, and enjoy, see you next week.